All right, it's time to finally talk about Unicorn Overlord. After months of gameplay, I finally completed this incredible game. 130 hours I put into Unicorn Overlord, and I don't regret a single moment of it. Total perfect downtime game to kick back and play for 30 minutes here and there. Absolutely loved it. So what I wanted to do today is come in and give you a review, a spoiler-free review. Then I also want to talk about 10 things I wish I had known at the beginning that could have dramatically altered my gameplay. I'll give you those 10 tips. Again, these are spoiler-free tips, but I think these could dramatically improve your gameplay if you're thinking about picking up Unicorn Overlord for the first time, or if you want to go back and replay the game like I'm going to. I know at some point I'm going to dive back into this game. It's just that good. So, hey everyone, I'm Clayton Morris. Welcome into the channel. So great to have you here. I'm bringing you my comprehensive review of Unicorn Overlord today, specifically on the Nintendo Switch. That's where I played the game. And I will say, I think one of my big regrets for this game is that I didn't play it on the PS5 because I really would have loved to have gotten all those trophies. Yes, I 100%ed the game, so did everything you could do in this game. I'm talking every side quest, every treasure map, every leveling up, every city, everything. So I would have got a, a nice platinum on the PS5, but I didn't. I played it on the Nintendo Switch, but I also don't regret it. I was able to take it on airplanes. I was able to travel around the world with my Nintendo switch so i got a lot of unicorn overlord time in hotels and traveling so you know hey look whatever what, what are you gonna do you know maybe eventually i'll play it on the ps5 and get that platinum okay i'm a huge fan of jrpgs and this game is a sterling example of why this genre remains timeless all right so let's get into this game right from the get-go just putting the cartridge in the nintendo switch unicorn overlord had me hooked beautiful crafted world i love the intricate storyline the game places you in a land of like mystical creatures, a lot of ancient secrets that you're having to, to discover, a plot that unfolds with every quest and every little side mission you undertake. Uh, the attention to detail here in this game design is absolutely phenomenal. And let, me, let me just say this. I was playing this game and I thought to myself, how in the world did humans come up with this? Like, How did humans come up with all of this that comes together in this incredible web from this treasure map that you're finding over here, you could only get it if you did this thing over here, and only if you did it in this particular way, and all of it comes together. Like, I just don't understand. I mean, look behind me here. You see all of these incredible lands. There's five different lands that you have to explore and, and dive into, and just the, the, the rich characters, the dialogue, the music, the world building is absolutely phenomenal. Now, I know there's been some criticism out there that, hey, maybe the story, you know, isn't as strong. It's not like a Xenoblade story, right? But it's still a fantastic story. And I love the tactics, the strategy, and all of this. I don't need it to be a massively intricate story because I got the strategy and the tactics. And the dialogue scenes, the little cutscenes in between battles are just long enough. They don't drag on too long. We're not talking like Tales level cutscenes here that drag on 45 minutes. No, no. They're perfect. They're bite sized. Get me back into the strategy. Keep it moving along. Let's keep it moving, right? So this narrative in this game is both grand, it's deeply personal, it revolves around the protagonist's journey through this war-torn kingdom. The characters you meet along the way are wonderfully developed. Um, each of them have their great own backstories, it adds a lot of different layers to the main plot of the game. Whether you're finding all these sort of like enigmatic sorcerers or you have these flawed knights, I love a, a lot of the knights in this game are pretty flawed. You know, and it makes them fun. It makes them fun. And I love the rapport building conversations that you're getting between these different characters. They they all belong in this sort of realm that they've created here. And I will say none of these characters like feel out of place. Like that character clearly doesn't belong in Unicorn Overlord. Like none of that. They all feel right at home here. Um, the gameplay mechanics, though, is where the game really shines. I mean, turn-based strategy battles that are engaging. They require you to think like several steps ahead, but in not in like a Fire Emblem kind of way. You know, in a Fire Emblem game, you can tell almost that you've lost and you knew that you lost like five turns ago. Like you'll get to a point you're like, oh, okay, I see. Five turns ago, I really screwed this up. Now I've got to restart this battle. I spent 40 minutes on this battle. I've got to restart it. That's not the case with Unicorn Overlord. It gives you enough rope to hang yourself by, in, in so to speak. And, and what I mean by that is you can be sort of making changes on the fly. You can really, oh, I, I screwed up over here. 
let me reposition this guy here really quick and it and it and it doesn't set you back i mean you can really make decisions on the fly that move the story along and keep your strategy and your tactics battles going each character has unique abilities roles that make the team composition a vital part of your success you're going to have a lot of fun like building out your units and deciding, okay, do I want archers in the back row? Do I want a thief in the front row? Do I want, uh, you know, a knight in the front, cavalry in the back? Do I want a warlock or a sorcerer in the back row to love, you know, throw some fire damage while I've stunned my, te you know, stunned my enemies? All of these things come into play. And I will say this: I think what's crazy about this game is that if you're not into any of that, you're like really not into like optimizing your team. You're not into like figuring out the right types of weapons and shields and and thing like you know pendants to wear around their necks and hats that they'll wear that will help them you know level up and be stronger in battle if you're not into any of that well first of all why are you playing this game no no but uh you can actually click an optimize button when you're in a particular menu you can hit the little plus button and you can optimize your build out for each character so if you're not really into like the swords and the shields and you don't really know how to stack them properly you could just click optimize and the game will take care of it it'll put the right things the right items for your character mostly now i will say a little bit later in the game as you're really battling some heavy enemies you're going to want to optimize things yourself you're going to want to tweak things and add certain um, different uh, tomes and books that will give you additional fire damage and things if you're you know if you're a sorcerer and you can level some uh, you shoot some fireballs at somebody why not have the fire tome book that allows you to do even more damage right those are things that I don't think are fully optimized with the clicking the optimize button but nevertheless it gets you off the hook you don't have to do all of that um, and the same thing you know on items the same thing with their abilities and uh, and, and all of that so again you can choose to just optimize and forget it, set it and forget it, and go play the game. So it really does allow you to have this granularity. You can go into the menus, you can really, really dial in how your, bat how your battles are going to unfold. You can choose, okay, my cavalry in the back, when they, I mean, this is how granular it can get. Like my cavalry in the back, I only want my horse cavalry to attack, and I only want them to attack the front row if this person is a non-magic enemy and they have less than 50% uh, hit points, you know, like that's how granular you can get with your strategy for your different battles, which I absolutely loved. And I really didn't go too deeply into that until later in the game and at the end game when I had to fight Galerius, the main, the main villain in the game. So again, you can get as granular as you want, or you can sort of set it and forget it, Ron Popeil style, and just optimize the gameplay. So I will say this game really encourages exploration. There's always something new to discover, whether it's a hidden dungeon a rare item, uh, a secret character that can help you and set off on some side quests. Um, you can really spend time leveling up, doing different uh, different sigil battles as well to get better at your combat skills, but also getting some great military books and treatises that will allow you in the items uh, section to increase your character's XP and then raise their level, which is really great. So you can actually do some grinding if you want to. And I did that for quite a while because I was really under leveled when I went into sort of my final battle, so I had to go back and play some sigil quests for quite a while to really level up certain characters and a new unit that I put together to really make sure that I could uh, complete that final battle. You know, as someone who enjoys both retro and new games, I was impressed with how Unicorn Overlord balances a lot of nostalgic elements with a lot of modern aesthetics. This game loads quickly, it's beautiful, and it has this really gorgeous, um, I say lush, like medieval quality to it. All of the different menus and when you're saving the game, they look gorgeous. Everything. The art style is beautiful. It's a beautiful blend of like hand drawn and digital art. It has a stunning world to it, something I've never really seen before. And the soundtrack is amazing and kind of mesmerizing. There were times where I was sitting doing work and I literally put on the just the menu screen so I could listen to the Unicorn Overlord songs in the background while I was just doing some work. I wasn't even playing the game, but the soundtrack is so good. It's so mesmerizing. It just has this beautiful medieval quality to it that is just enriching the overall experience.
I mean, having 100% completed this game, I can safely say it's worth every hour I spent. I explored every nook and cranny. I completed every side quest, collected every rare item. And after completing it, I found myself wanting to jump back in. And I almost wanted to go back and start from the beginning. And now that I knew a, a lot of extra things, I had a you know much greater sense of, of the game. And I was like, oh, I should go back in. I could, I could really uh, play this game from scratch all over again. And some of my great... You know, whether it's World of Warcraft or, you know, great strategy and tactics games over the years, I've always gone back to them. And this, to me, is one of those games that will have unbelievable replay value for years to come. You know, before I transition into my tips, I'm going to give you 10 tips here. I want to take a moment, though, and shout out, like, the fantastic work by the developers at Atlas. I mean, I will say this is the first Atlas game I've ever played. I'm absolutely floored by it. Their reputation, of course, for creating deep, engaging JRPGs is well earned. And now that I've completed Unicorn Overlord, I can safely say I can't wait to dive into other Atlas titles like Odin Sphere, 13 Sentinels, Aegis Rim. And if they're anything like this gameplay, I know I'm in for a real treat. I know 13 Sentinels, it, it acts more as like a visual novel, um, but Odin Sphere, I, I really can't wait to dive into these games. But as much as I loved Unicorn Overlord, there are a few things I wish I'd known before diving in. So here are top 10 tips, my top 10 tips that could make your journey through the game even more enjoyable if you plan to play it. Number one, explore every corner of the map. Don't rush through this game. There were times where I just sat down and I wasn't going to go to any major battles or major story advancements. And I just spent time going, going around and finding fish and wood and uh, iron ore and things like that. Just exploring the map. Never rush through this game. Each area is packed with hidden treasures, side quests. They're not just fun, but they're also providing valuable rewards along the way. I mean, hidden in trees. There are all sorts of things hidden everywhere throughout this map and it's sort of vital that you uncover and discover these things if you see stone circles on the ground you see different statues all of these things and in, in many ways can come to life if you know what i mean so you do not want to skip these things all right number two mining okay this is a really important part of the story and it's something i didn't do until later game okay huge mistake i wish i would have done this from the beginning which is there are mining opportunities in, in all five of the nation areas throughout this map, okay? There's five nations, five lands, they all have a mine, okay? Go and talk to the miner who you can pay to get in or sometimes you'll get a free mining ticket that lets you go and mine. Now, what's interesting is that you'll find iron ore and all sorts of really important items that you'll need to upgrade different cities and things like that. Also things that you'll need to upgrade weapons like feverite, which will help you upgrade your own swords and different weapons. However, there are buried treasure maps within these mines. And the only way to get these buried treasure maps are to really mine the heck out of it. And there are six different treasure maps per mine. It, it, I know it gets a little complicated and a little technical, but once you understand that each of these treasure maps then leads to sort of an X marks the spot on the main map where you can go and find a really important item. So again, mining is so important. Find all of the treasure maps for all of the areas. So each of the nations has six different treasure maps associated with it with really important items. And some of these items are key to beating the game. You need to get some of these items. And I waited until sort of the end of the game to even realize that and do it. Uh, and then I spent almost a whole day of gameplay just going and mining. I became a mining expert. So make sure you mine right from the beginning. Take some time out and do that every so often. Don't wait till the end. All right, number three, level up strategically. Don't just grind for the sake of grinding. Pay attention to the characters and how you're putting these teams together and use the sigil quests, okay? You'll notice that there are different battles, right? There are liberation quests, there are main story quests, and you'll notice that there are sigil quests as well, which can only be activated once you discover some stone circles. Use these sigil quests as leveling up locations, but really be strategic about how you're leveling up by putting your teams together and thinking about how you're going to use them late stage later in the game. And that's something that I really started to focus on about halfway through the game, thinking about the end game and making sure, for instance, putting one, one team together that had warlocks in the back row and doing all of this. In fact, I built a team that was was unbelievable, okay? That was able to defeat Galerius, who's the main villain in the game, the main enemy, 
And I'm, let me know in the comments below if you want me to build a video for you guys on how I built this amazing unit that crushed Galerius, okay? I mean, I annihilated him. But it was only after I strategically put this unit together and I spent about maybe two weeks working on this team to figure out the right fit that I could go in and annihilate Galerius. It was a lot of testing. I made a lot of mistakes. I got my ass handed to me a number of times by Galerius. So I will tell you, um, I put together a killer team. Let me know in the comments below. I'll build a whole video specifically on that end game team if you're interested and what I used to great success. So make sure you're leveling up strategically. Pay attention to which characters need leveling up based on sort of upcoming challenges in the game. All right, number four, use elemental magic wisely. I, certain enemies are weak to specific elemental attacks. Make sure to exploit these weaknesses to make battles easier. And this is actually particularly important once again for the final boss. Think about how you can like stack your warlocks and druids and elves to launch stun attacks, you know, like right at the start of a battle. This is important because you could launch a stun attack, totally stops those enemies in their tracks, allowing you then to swoop in with some other elemental magic and do some fire damage, launch fireballs and other things like that. So think about how you could use elemental magic as you start to unlock some of those characters uh, in the game, warlocks and druids and things like that as the game goes on. All right, number five, keep an eye on your gear. I was not very good at this, admittedly, until maybe about three fourths of the game, the way through the game. I was kind of doing an optimized thing. I wasn't really focusing on my swords and my shields and things like that. But more importantly, it's the gear that's not just the sword and the shield. It's the pendants that you're wearing. It's the tomes, you know, the big books. It's like the fire tome that you can then stack on a particular warlock or druid who has a fireball ability. Like, why not give that fireball ability extra power? right, by stacking your gear properly. And I, I kind of wasn't doing that. I got a little lazy at certain parts and I wish I would have done that more at the beginning, stacking my gear properly. I would have just started annihilating people. This was one of my big mistakes. Again, it wasn't until the end of the game that I started paying attention to the gear. And I was taking the lazy way out. I was sort of clicking optimize and all of that. Big mistake. Um, so again, I'll, I'll show you how I built this team. If you're interested, let me know in the comments below. All right, number six, manage your resources. Conserve your potions and other consumables for tougher battles. Don't waste them. Sometimes healing magic alone won't cut it. You know, you might have a regeneration um, or a healer on your team. That's great. But what if you get separated and that person cannot reach over and provide you with healing touch or a healing valor? Uh, you need to then make sure you've got enough healing potions and also revival orbs, revival potions, because you're going to die. And to have a revival, a number of revival potions by going to different provisioners in different towns, you, you want to stack those up. And make sure also you have enough hollowed corn ashes, okay? I know, what is a hallowed corn ash? There's going to be times, and I did this a lot, where I ran out of time on the battle. I did this quite a bit, and there's a way to kind of reset the clock, give yourself more time. And that is to use a hollowed corn ash um, to basically continue the battle and it almost resets the clock for you. I had to do that a bunch of times too. So make sure you've got healing potions. Make sure you have a lot of revival orbs. Make sure you have hallowed corn ashes uh, that you can trade divine shards for. I know this might sound like weird talk right now, but it'll all make sense in short order. Something else that I kind of discovered early on, so I'm glad that I did, you want to fight enemies before going into battle. So as you're exploring the map, you're going to find that there's are there are enemies that suddenly just start, start charging to, towards you. Now, you haven't engaged in a battle, so to speak. You haven't clicked on, let's start this battle. You've just been roaming the map, and you know that you hear like a little whistle. And one of these one of these enemies will just start coming towards you and attacking you. Do as many of those as you can, because every one of those gives you honor points. And if you avoid them, you are leaving tons of honor points on the table. And real the real currency in this game is not gold. It's honor points. The more honor points you have, the more abilities you have to unlock additional units, expand your units, promote your units all of that. So you want to get as much honor as you can. And one way to do that is kind of clear the whole field. You might have like five or six of these guys roaming around in the woods and they might just start coming at you and attacking you. Fight them. Okay. Get honors points from these guys and then go and take the main battle. Cause there's always like a main battle that's like kind of situated right near there. 
but just kind of walk around, gather up all the different resources, the, the, the lumber, the iron ore, the gold, and battle these guys and get all those honors points. Number eight on my list, talk to every NPC. This might go without saying if you're used to playing JRPGs, but talk to everyone. Everyone has a story and they often provide crucial information, even rare items, so do not ignore them. And a lot of these NPCs will unlock additional quests that you need in order to complete the game. So don't ignore them. Don't just walk by them and be rude. Number nine on my list is to pay attention to the day night cycle. This is something, again, I wasn't really paying attention to early on, but some quests and events only happen at certain times of the day. So in, right there on your screen, you can see the day night cycle. Plan your in game accordingly because for instance, the black market dealer, guess what? He only comes out at night and you need to buy certain things from that black magic dealer, that black market dealer, like magic bombs, for instance, um, and other things. There are going to be actual items you'll need to buy to stack and to in order to fight the final boss. So you need to pay attention to the day night cycle in a lot of the different quests and when you're making different purchases. So pay attention to that. All right, number 10 on my list, ranged attacks. This is something, sadly, I only learned after I completed the game. Now, you can use ranged attacks. One thing I did know during the game is how to use archers and different soldiers that I was summoning using valor points, okay? So I'm, I'm a unit, but I don't have any archers. I could summon archers. And then when I go into battle, I could choose hit the Y button, choose a ranged attack, and yes, use my archers who are not part of my main unit to fire some arrows and take out a huge amount, take it down a huge amount of damage on the enemies. Well, one thing I didn't realize is that if, if I got a separate unit that has archers in it, really good archers, you could actually set one of those archers to be the leader. When you do that is when you are then unlocking ranged attacks for that particular unit. For instance, you're on the field, okay? And you notice there's a watchtower. Well, what you could do is send your unit that has archers to that watchtower. But the only way that you can use those ranged attacks from that watchtower is if you've made your archer the leader of that unit. And what's great about Unicorn Overlord is that you can actually change that on the fly. So in battle, before battle, you can actually change the who's the leader on that particular unit. You can withdraw them from, from battle, change the leader, put them back in the battle. So you don't, you're not locked in is what I'm saying. But make sure that you make that person the leader, the archer, the leader, or the, you know, the mage to use magical assist attacks as well. And you can position them on watchtowers and then you, you can have one of your main units driving in and then you'll be allowed to hit Y as a ranged attack. This is huge. I really wish I would have done a better job of this throughout the game. I didn't. I beat the game kind of not even doing it that way, which is crazy. But I, I think I could have a much easier time, a way easier time to use a lot of those ranged attacks. So don't do what I did. I mean, don't wait till the end of the game to figure that out. And I'm gonna give you a bonus tip. Number 11, use valor skills. I, my son was playing it and he kept going into battle and before he would go into battle, I would say, use your valor skills because he kept forgetting that he had them. For instance, Elaine, okay, the main character in the game, he has a valor boost that you're gonna wanna use before every battle if you can spare two valor points. It'll cost you two points, but I'll give you a, it'll give you a 100% boost in experience when you defeat an enemy in battle. So two points, launch your valor skills, look for the boost in experience that is gonna give you 100% additional experience points in every battle. And you can keep using it up over and over and over again if you want. Also, cast a valor skill on other units. So if you're there and you don't want Elaine to keep getting the experience, he can cast that Valor on somebody else that you're trying to level up. It's a great way to level up, and it's a great way to gain extra experience for doing really nothing other than using your Valor points. Also, Plunder. Another one that I used all the time, Joseph's unit, or if you have a Thief in your unit, you'll then be able to have a Valor point or Valor skill of Plunder. Before you engage in battle, okay, before you get to that battle screen and you're, uh, you're about to approach an enemy, Hit that plunder, go into Valor and plunder them and it'll steal their gold. It'll steal their gold. And when you get to level two, plunder level two as you get further in the game, then you can steal multiple units gold all at once. It'll pick like a range and you get, you get all their gold for doing nothing. All you've got to do is plunder them ahead of time. So your thieves kind of sneak up and pickpocket them and steal their money. It's a great way to get extra gold. It's a great way to get extra points. Again, 
use your valor skills. They are vital to this game and they're fantastic actually from healing to plundering to, to regeneration. If you die and you're out of revival orbs or revival potions, then you can regenerate and or resurrect and also regenerate your team and provide fortressing protections and all sorts of stuff. So use your valor skills. Okay, guys, I'm just saying that. So there you have it, guys, my glowing review of Unicorn Overlord and some handy tips to get you started on your adventure. If you enjoyed this review, be sure to check out my other videos for other game reviews and other things that I'm doing here on the channel. Just hanging out, talking about video games and let me know in the comments below. Do you want me to make a simple short video on the ultimate team that I used to defeat Galerius, the final boss in Unicorn Overlord? Let me know. I'll tell you how I built that team and I'll do a video on it. Until next time, everyone. I hope you go out and check out Unicorn Overlord, one of my games of the year, one of my favorite games ever. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I do, and we'll see you next time.